activity, or lecture video, I should say, from the Nationalism Revolution Unit, we're going to focus on the multi-ethnic empires that were um, in place in, in place in Europe in the in the 18th, 1800s, the 19th century. And there's two major ones. There's Austria-Hungary, and then there's also um, the Ottoman Empire. But for, to start, we're going to focus on Austria-Hungary. So a multi-ethnic empire is, is an empire um, where one ruler controls a large piece of territory that includes lots of different or multi-ethnic groups. Um, and so, for example, in Austria-Hungary at this time, you have, they control German-speaking people like Austrians. They also control what would now be the Czech Republic, so Czechs, um, Slovaks, Hungarians, Croatians, Slovenians, Bosnians, Serbians, and Romanians, right? So a lot of different, uh, what we would call Slavic people, because they all speak similar languages, languages, which are part of that Slavic language. Um, and they kind of rule over this whole territory. Originally, this multi-ethnic empire um, was actually just ruled by the Austrians. Um, this goes back to the Habsburg, which you might, the Habsburgs, you might remember them from last year. Uh, the Habsburgs were, were an ancient European family that controlled much of Central Europe for a long, long time. Um, and as we get more into the, in the modern era, the 1800s, they... Um, kind of centralized in Austria, and instead of having control over more of Central Europe, they start going more towards uh, Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, but they're multi-ethnic, right? Which means these groups of people, like uh, Croatians, Slovaks, um, Austrians, Hungarians, right? They all speak different languages. They have different shared pasts. Um, one thing that most of them have in common is they most of them tend to be Catholic, um, although in parts of Eastern Europe, there's um, they're Orthodox and even some Muslims. So it's not fully homogeneous religiously, but most of them tend to be Catholic. So that's one thing that happens to unify most of them. Uh, but they do speak different languages, and they very much have this sense of being different. Um, and that's going to cause some problems for the empire when they're trying to stay together. And in fact, eventually, uh, around this time period, Orsha begins to kind of have to... They begin to weaken a little bit, right? And they, they can't just keep complete control by themselves as just the Austrians. And so they decide to kind of partner up with the Hungarians, which is one of the larger of the ethnic groups that they controlled. Uh, the Hungarians had constantly been agitating to kind of gain some independence or at least more equality. Uh, a man named Louis Kosuth is kind of a famous Hungarian figure in that sense. He was a person who tried to help the Hungarians kind of achieve this. And so eventually Austria, what they established is they established something called a dual monarchy. Uh, where there's actually two separate kings. There's the king of Austria and there's the king of Hungary. So it gives Hungary a large degree of independence, although they have some things that they keep together. So for example, they work together in foreign affairs, so dealing with other countries and other empires, and also dealing with finances. That was dealt with as collectively. Things that you know had to deal with just particular you know, geographic region, regional issues or things like that were kept separate by the Hungarian and the Austrian king. Uh, and so... Once that happens, though, the risk is that the Austrians kind of open this floodgate of, well, the Hungarians can have these things. Why can't the Croatians? Why can't the Slovakians? Why can't the Czechs, right? And so this is going to become an issue for Austria-Hungary. The second major uh, multi-ethnic empire in Europe at this time are the Ottomans. So the Ottomans have a long ancient history. They conquer... Istanbul, which was at that time Constantinople, which you might might sound familiar to you, that was part of the Byzantine Empire and originally the Roman Empire. And in 1492, the Ottomans, who are a Muslim group from Central Asia, actually take control of the city. And from there, they are able to expand a little bit further into uh, Europe. And so for a long time, there's actually a Muslim presence in Southeast Europe. So we associate Europeans mostly as being Christian, uh, overwhelmingly Catholic, some Orthodox as well. Uh, but there's also a sizable Muslim population in parts of southeastern Europe because the Ottomans had been such a presence there for so long. So from the 14 and 1500s, the Ottomans take control of modern-day parts of Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, the Ukraine, um, Albania, that part of, of Europe, and they, they extend their influence there. At their extent, their greatest height in, in the 1680s, they went as, almost as far as Vienna, uh, in fact, they almost conquered Vienna and they were defeated, uh, which was seen as a big victory for Christian Europe because they many Christians in Europe and Western Europe felt that if Vienna fell, they would just keep spreading and, and Islam would take control. So from 1683, though, 
until they're finally kind of defeated formally in World War One, um, that is, you know, we see a gradual decline in the Ottomans, right? And when an, an empire starts to decline, right, uh, it gives the small ethnic groups within that empire an opportunity to try to fight and gain their own independence. And so collectively, a lot of people, call, a lot of the monarchs and rulers of Europe, particularly Western Europe, like France and England, um, they dubbed the Ottoman Empire the sick man of Europe, right? It was kind of, the Ottomans were the, the issue in Europe, right? And they, the fear was that the illness or the sickness that they had would, would spread, right? Um, and this is what the title they get all the way up until World War I. Um, they have this, 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 t- this title. In 1830, uh, Greece gains their independence, and so does Serbia. So 1830, the revolutions of 1830, which spread all throughout Europe, were pretty successful uh, for the et- some of the ethnic groups under the control of the Ottomans. In particular, these Greeks and the Serbians gained independence. On top of that, other groups like the Bulgarians and the Romanians try. And while they're not successful this time around, it does show and give a greater sense that these multi-ethnic empires are going to have a a huge challenge in in addressing this new wave of nationalism, right? If people like the Greeks and the Serbs and the Bulgarians have this sense that they are their own nation and should be ruled as such, that's just not going to go away. Even if you happen to defeat them in one revolution, there's a real possibility that that can continue and happen again and again until they achieve their goal. All right, and so the question that we're going to uh, kind of end with today for you guys just to think about, uh, and then we're going to start off next class with, uh, is how might nationalism affect multi-ethnic empires? So we talked a little bit about two examples of that and what happens to them or what try, what some people try to make happen to them. Uh, and so I want you to think about that question for next time we see each other in person.